together, Lord, bind us together with the Lord that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with love. There is only one God, there is only one King, there is only one body, that is why we can sing. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, that cannot be broken. Bind us together, Lord, bind us together, Lord, bind us together with morning. Welcome to church at Matriarch at Malvin. We're glad each one of you are here with us today. I hope each one has picked up a bulletin. I'm not going to go over things in the bulletin. I will add a few things. Let's remember our shut-ins that's in the bulletin and all of our sick. <clears throat> also, the seminary is going to be having upcoming surgery, so let's keep them also in our prayers. <coughs> I'm at uh, Lori Schultz. She failed, I think it was last week, and she found broke her leg and broke it in two places. So let's keep her in our prayers because she won't be able to come down now for a few weeks now. I think they said it'd be six weeks before she can try to walk on it again. Also, Diane Firecloud, she's going to the doctor's coming Tuesday. Is that right? And they're going to be uh, seeing about her knee. She's going to probably have knee replacement surgery. So let's uh, also keep her in our prayers. So the personal works will be after the evening services today, so I hope each one can be back and help with that. Also, our fellowship meal will be next Sunday after the morning worship service. Into our uh, services today, our song leader will be Joel Foster, our scripture reading Greg Maddox, our lesson by Dennis Strine, our closure prayer by Paul Luttrell, in our worship service with open prayer and be with Jeremiah. Please pray with me. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for the opportunity to be here in your house this morning with fellow Christians. We're thankful for every team you bless us with us. We're always thankful for the homes and our families and all the good things that we're blessed with in this country. We're thankful for our nation and freedom we have in this country, the United States of America. We pray for our leaders to make these leaders who Allow us to continue to worship in peace and, and uh, we pray for we pray for people in the world who are oppressed like the people over in over in Siberia right now. We pray for them in Ukraine that they will provide some relief from the oppression that they're suffering. We pray for we pray for others in the world who are not doing well today. We pray for each one. Heavenly Father, we're always mindful of our own number who are sick and not well. We go through this morning. We pray. We always pray for Sue Dills and Teen Westmoreland, who remember Ruth and Deborah and Rick and as they are go trials with her conditions. We pray for her to have a recovery from her faults that she had. We pray for others who are sick this morning. Heavenly Father, we don't know about all of them, but we know that. When we have some surgery plan, we pray for them that they'll do well. We always pray to watch over and care for them as they encounter these, these seasons in life. Heavenly Father, we're thankful for our opportunity to serve this community in our area. 
We pray for the church so that we can grow and be strong and be good good big examples to those around us. Your church might grow in this area. Our Heavenly Father, we pray for the mission work that we work with, especially in India, because of the oppression over there. We pray for the busy city and the serving today at the moment, which might allow Christians to to be working in, in an area and not be oppressed. We pray for we pray for Jimmy Richardson and the work he does in Brazil. We pray you always be with him and bless him and care for him and the opportunity that work in that area. <coughs> Heavenly Father, we pray for our community, for those around us that we would seek those who would come and be with us and learn more about your word. Heavenly Father, we For this morning, that you be with us as we worship you in two allegiance and songs. We will join in to worship you in spirit and truth. Heavenly Father, we pray for everyone in present this morning. You be with us as we will come and worship you together, and that we can do so in ways which are simple and pleasing in your sight. It's our, it's our, it's our intention, Heavenly Father, to. to Always do things that will according to your will and be acceptable in your sight. And we pray now you be with us and care for us care for us. We worship together. We pray all these things in the strong and loving name of your Son Jesus Christ. Amen. One zero zero. One zero zero.
thousands of years ago, even before our brother Dennis was around, there was a man named Abraham. And Abraham was a man that found favor with God. God said to Abraham, gather your wife and your belongings and leave your family. Go to this strange land. Leave Everything you've ever known. Everything. Your friends, your mom, your dad, your brothers, your sisters. Everything. And Abraham followed God and did God as God instructed him to do. Abraham found himself in a land that child sacrifice was common. Where the religions of that time thought it was a good thing to take your child, sacrifice them on an altar, and it would bring favor. So God came to Abraham, and he said to him in the 22nd chapter of Genesis, Now it came to pass, after these things, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here am I. And he said, now take your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I tell you, will tell you. So Abram, Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey, took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son. And they split wood for the burnt offering. And arose and went to the place where God told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, and I and the lad will go over there, and we will worship and return to you. Now Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon his son Isaac, and he took his hand, uh, took a knife in his hand in the fire. So the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked together. Then they came to the place which God had told them, Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand, took the knife to slay his son. 
But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. He said, do not stretch out your hand against the land. Do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God. And since you have not withheld your son, your only son from me. I don't think any of us have gone through what Abraham went. Nobody's asked us to intentionally offer one of our children as a sacrifice. <clears throat> Nobody's asked us to do that. But God asked Abraham to do it. And Abraham was willing to give his only son. But God stopped it. God didn't require it. But God, loving us, you and I, so much that when the time was right, he sent his son. He allowed his son to be taken by ungodly men, to be falsely accused, to be laid on the cross and have nails pounded into his hand and his feet. God allowed that to happen because he loved you and I so much and he cared so much about us. And this morning as we gather around this table, it's time for us to think about our lives. What have we given up for Christ? Have we really given up things of the world and followed him and given ourselves over to him? God did the hard work. God gave his son, and he died there for us. And that's why we're here today, to gather around this table, to remember his son, to remember that sacrifice. God wasn't willing for one of the earthly fathers to sacrifice their child. But God went above and beyond and sacrificed him. His son. This morning, as we partake of this fellowship meal, we have the unleavened bread that represents the body of his son. We have the fruit of the vine that represents the blood of his son that was shed for each one of us. And God and Jesus ask that we do this to remember him, to remember that sacrifice. I wonder if Abraham ever forgot the day that God asked him to offer his son. I wonder if Isaac ever forgot the day his father was willing to offer him as a sacrifice for God. I wonder if we forget the day that God asked us to offer ourselves, not our lives, not our children, not our spouse, but just to change our lives and follow him. I hope that we never forget that either as we partake of this meal. Let us pray. Lord God, we thank you for this time that we have to gather around this table. We thank you for this time of fellowship that we have with one another, that we can be here on this day to remember your son, to remember that sacrifice that he made for us, to remember how he willingly laid his life down on that cross, how he suffered so many things before his actual death, and he did that for us so that we could be with you in heaven, so that we can call you Father, that we can call you Lord, and that we can look to your Son who sits at your right hand and know that we can be delivered because of his great love and because of your great love for each of us. Be with us as we partake of this bread. 
Help us to remember what he suffered and how he did it freely and willingly for us. In his name we pray. Let us continue in prayer. Lord God, we thank you for this fruit of the vine that represents the blood of your son. The blood that he shed for our sins. He did this willingly. We know that if he had prayed out to you, you would have sent him 10,000 angels to deliver him. But he knew what was at stake. He knew the lives, the spiritual lives of each and every one of us was on the line. He chose to stay on that cross, to allow his blood to be shed, to allow his life to be taken. He allowed himself to die on that cross for our sin. Help us strive to be more like him and to remember him all the days of our lives. And that we partake of this fruit of the vine to remember the great sacrifice he made on our behalf. He died to cleanse us, to set us free. In his name we pray.
is not part of our worship service, but uh, we have an opportunity to give back a portion of it, uh, which has uh, given to us. Let us pray. Our most gracious and kind Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this opportunity where we have to give back a portion which has given unto us. Let us all do this in a manner pleasing unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> How deep the Father's love. How deep the Father's love. How deep the Father's love for us. How vast beyond all measure. That he I know. 
seven three. Four seven three. There is a name I love to hear, I love to sing His word. It sounds like music in my ear, the sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Oh, how I love Jesus. Because He first loved me. Tells me of a Savior's love who died to set me free. It tells me of his precious blood, the sinner's perfect plea. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! Because he first loved me, it tells of one whose loving heart can feel my deepest woe, who in each sorrow bears a part that none can bear below. Oh, how I love Jesus! Oh, how I love Jesus! How I love Jesus because he first loved me. Our hymn of encouragement this morning will be five zero. Five zero. Before our lesson, faithful love. Faithful love. If it's convenient, we ask you to stand. Faithful love flowing down from the thorn covered crown makes me whole, stirs my soul, washes whiter than snow. Faithful love comes each fair. Stretches out, drives each tear, holds my hand when I can't stand no more. I own faithful love from above came to earth to show the Father's love. Faithful love. 
and I'll never be the same, for I've seen faithful love face to face, and Jesus is here stay. Scripture reading this morning will be coming from 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 4 through 8. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Charity, charity suffereth long and is kind. Charity, charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, doth not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, <clears throat> rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth, rejoiceth in the truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies that shall fail, whether there be tongues, they shall cease, whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Just ignore the tire tracks have been thrown under the bus. You can't help but read these words and notice that by nature that God's love is compelling. And both the Apostle John and Paul wrote that we love God because God first loved us. In Ephesians 5, in the first two verses, Paul wrote that therefore be imitators of God. As beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us, a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. And then in 1 John chapter 4, verse 11, John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And then in verse 19, he said, we love because he first loved us. Why is love so important to the lives of Christians? Now, the first thing that I can think of is that love is the very nature of God. That God is love. In verse 8 of John chapter, or 1 John chapter 4, John said, Anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. And when we look in Galatians chapter 5, in verses 22 and 23, where Paul writes to us about the fruits of the Spirit, the very first fruit that leads the whole thing off is love. It is a result of God living in us. And all of those other fruits that come after love magnifies that love. The Bible teaches us that the love is the greatest attribute that Christians can have. 1 Corinthians 13, verse 13. So now faith Hope and love abide. These three, but the greatest of these is love. Friends, any religion in this world, any religion without love is useless. It is love that ties all other Christian characteristics together. And the proof of this is in Colossians 3 and verse 14. It says, Above all, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And it is Paul that maintains that it is love that fulfills the law of God in Romans chapter 13 and verse 10, that love does no wrong to the neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. 
when we read the four Gospels. We can read in there many times how Jesus spoke about love. In Matthew chapter 22 and verses 37 through 39, Jesus said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your mind and with all your soul. And this is the great and first commandment. The second is like it, that you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And then over in John chapter 13, starting in verse 34, Jesus said, A new commandment I give you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. And by this all people will know that you are my disciples, if you have love one for another. Friends, it's God's love that nudges us to love one another. And as John that sums it up in 1 John chapter 5 and verses 7 through 12, for John, he says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. And anyone who does not love does not love God, because God is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son, so that we might live through him. And in this love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. And no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God abides in us. And his love is perfected in us. The description of this love that we're to have for one another we find in the 13th chapter of 1 Corinthians. In essence here, Paul is saying that love is like light in that it is made up of several components. Now, when we typically look at light itself, whether it's the sun or, or one of these lights, it appears to us to be a single component. But if we were to pass that light through a prism, we find that that light is made up of several colors, the colors of the rainbow. And while the rainbow has those seven colors, love has eight components. And Paul passes this love through that prism of inspiration. And this process lets us see how love is broken down into its essential elements. For instance, love is patience. Love is willing to wait. It never gets in a hurry. It's never anxious. It doesn't force the issue, but it is ready to do its work when the call comes. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things. The attribute of love is saying that love puts up with an awful lot before any thought is given to payback. And love is kind, and kind is something that we do. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, John said, Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. The greatest thing that we can do is to be kind to God's human creation. In Matthew chapter 25, Jesus is painting this picture of sheep and goats. And in that scene, he did so with the active attribute of love, where he declared in verse 40, Truly I say to you, as you did it to the least of these, my brothers, you've done it to me. Now love also acts with a proper motive. Verse 4, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul says that love is not jealous, 
that it never resents the success of others. That love is not envious. That love never has ill feelings or resentment towards others. This special love never acts out of combativeness or competitiveness. Love is humble. Love is never arrogant. Someone once said that love, humility is love in hiding. You see, love is being courteous. Love will never behave in an unseemly manner. It's never rude. Love is always predictable. Love always does the appropriate thing, regardless of the circumstances. Friends, we can put the most uneducated person in society's highest circles. And if that uneducated person has the love in their hearts that God has in him, they will never, ever behave themselves inappropriately. We never have to wonder how love is going to act or react. For love always acts appropriately. And love is unselfish. It never is self-seeking. It never demands its own way. Friends, there's two kinds of people in this world. Two kinds. The first kind is those who continually think of themselves, those who demand a place in the spotlight, those who desire preeminence over others. And then there are those who are willing to humbly submit in service to others. In Matthew chapter 20, in verses 26 through 28, Jesus in this discourse said, but whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. And in John chapter 13, where Jesus was washing his disciples' feet, in verse 13, starting there, he said, you call me teacher and Lord, and, and you are right. For so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do just as I have done to you. Now, friends, I don't expect you to wash my feet. And I hope you don't expect me to wash your feet. But I, hopefully, I'm here to serve you and you are to serve me. We serve one another. Humbly serve. Never demanding something from others, but willing to give to others. Now, how many times have we maybe gone into a restaurant that was very busy? How many times did you see maybe a manager or system manager standing in the back and, and telling people to hurry up and do this or that? And how many times did you actually see one of the managers grab a tray to help one of the servers serve? Or take an order when they were so busy to help those who work for them? Those are servers. Those are servants. Love is even tempered. Love is never easily provoked. It is slow to anger. It's not touchy. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. And it always has a good disposition. Love is guileless. It is sincere. Never suspicious. Never delights in evil. Love always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. And love always looks for the best in others. And never gloats 
over the sins of others. And it is never self-righteous. And love perseveres. It never fails. And it lasts forever. Friends, love is eternal. When we look at the first three verses of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, Paul tells us that knowledge is going to pass away. He tells us that tongues are going to be silenced. He says that prophecies will cease. That love perseveres. It will go into eternity. It will be there with us because God is love. Now with these thoughts in mind, how can we express our love to one another? First, we need to be genuinely interested in all people. I'm not saying being busy buddies. I'm not saying being nosy. I'm saying truly be interested in one another. The one thing Jesus did was he saw people. Jesus didn't see the sins. He didn't see their political or social labels or the colors of their skin or where they came from. And he certainly never saw their educational or economic status. Jesus, better than anyone else, understood that all people were created in the image of God. Demonstrate our interest in one another. And we need to be compassionate. How many times do we read in the Bible where Jesus was moved with compassion? When he came in contact with the lepers, he was moved with compassion and he touched them. In Matthew 9, he had compassion on the crowds because they were like sheep without a shepherd. In Matthew 14, he had compassion on the people and healed their sick. In Matthew 20, he had compassion on two blind men and gave them their sight. Compassion is getting into and involved in the lives of others. And James spells this out perfectly in James chapter 2. Verse 15 and 16, he says, If a brother or sister is poorly clothed and lacking daily food, and one of you says, Go, in peace be warmed and filled without giving them the things needed for the body, what good is that? But he also tells us what pure religion is in James 1 and verse 27. A religion that God accepts because it is a religion of compassion. It is one that will look after the widows and the orphans. It is one that will take care of one another. And we have many ways that we can be compassionate to each other and to others. We just have to do it. And love is expressed through a spirit of forgiveness. And nowhere is Jesus' a spirit of forgiveness more evident than John chapter 8. That woman that was dragged before Jesus had caught in adultery. And after a while, when everybody had walked away, Jesus looked up to that woman. And asked her, did nobody condemn you? She said, no. That spirit of forgiveness was in Jesus' answer. Neither do I. Go your way and sin no more. It was love that prompted Jesus to forgive Peter, not once, but three times for denying Jesus. It was love that caused Stephen in Acts chapter 7, verse 60, 
when he was about to be stoned where he said, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And friends, not only do we have to have the spirit of forgiveness for others, we have to have that same spirit of forgiveness for ourselves. We have to be able to forgive ourselves. And then finally, love is expressed through submission. Jesus has plainly said that if you love me, you will keep my commandments. But how many of us do we love and understand God's love for us? Are we ready to allow his love to compel us to express our love to others? Think about this, and maybe ponder it this week. Our love for God is proportional to our willingness to submit to his will through the word. Our love is proportional to our willingness to become more like his son and to have the heart, mind, attitude, and disposition of his son. Friends, God's love reaches down from God to us in mercy and grace. His love compels us to reach up to God in worship and praise. But it also compels us to reach out to others in affection and compassion. This morning, will you allow God's mercy and grace to reach you by obeying the gospel call? Are you willing to become his child by faith and repentance? Are you willing to confess his name before others to have your sins washed away in New Testament baptism? If you are contemplating them things, but you want to know more, ask. And we will help you to understand these things. There's no fear. There's nothing wrong with asking the questions. Because it is a decision of monumental importance. It will end up being the most important decision you'll ever make in your life. And as a child of God, are we willing to love God enough to allow his spirit to lead us into loving others as we should? If anybody needs to make things right with God, whether it's to obey the gospel, whether it is to learn more, or whether it is to make things right with God, won't you come as together we stand in this? All have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you fully trusting in His grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood, in the soul-cleansing blood of the Lamb? in the blood of the Lamb? Are you walking daily by the Savior's side? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Do you rest each moment in the crucified? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Are you washed in the blood cleansing blood of the Lamb. Are your garments spotless? Are they white as snow? Are you washed in the blood of the Lamb? Lay aside the garments that are stained with sin and be washed in the blood of the Lamb. There's a fountain flowing for the soul unclean. Oh, be washed in the blood of the Lamb. Are you washed in the blood, in the 
sometimes and so good to see everybody that's here this morning we appreciate your attendance we look forward to seeing you again I encourage you to be back this evening at six for our evening worship um I want to say something real quick uh i'm 64 years old and i take things for granted at times I take things for granted that people understand what I'm talking about. I have been using YouTube since around the time that it actually became useful on the internet. That was 2006. And the scary thing about that, that I think about it, that's 25% of the time that I've spent here on the earth, I've been messing with YouTube. So when I ask people to do things, I assume that you understand what I'm talking about if you do anything with you two. And I've begun to realize that when we've asked you to do certain things, that you don't know what I'm talking about or what others are talking about. We ask you to subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's on the board behind me right now. And we're trying to, that camera that we got sitting there, we're trying to get to 50 subscribers so that we can broadcast these services live on YouTube. We were doing it on Facebook, but something went wrong. We're not able to do it anymore. So we're trying to reach 50. We've only had a YouTube channel since we started doing our broadcast back in June of last year. And it takes a while to build up a following. So we're at 45 right now. We're at the same place we were Wednesday night. And we've asked people to subscribe. And I've come to realize that when... Time Magazine or Publishers Clearinghouse sends you that big sheet of all those things that you can do. You're subscribing to magazines. You've got to pay for them. You don't have to pay for YouTube. We ask you to subscribe. All we're asking you to do is go to the channel, click the button where it says subscribe, and you're subscribed. There is no cost. There's no obligation. But we ask that you please, if you do anything on YouTube at all, please go to our channel. Search for Malden Church of Christ, and it will come up once you get to about Malden C. You'll see it there. You can just click on it, and then go in there and hit subscribe. We need 50, and then we can start. I've got several people that have been saying, when are you going to start broadcasting again? When are you going to start broadcasting again? We've got to get to 50, so I'm asking for your help. Uh, we, we're going along slowly, trudging along, and all of a sudden, boom, we got a bunch of people, and now we've hit a plateau again. So I ask your help. If you think about it this afternoon, look at it, pull out your phone and do that. We would greatly appreciate it. Be back this evening at 6 at all possible. <coughs> this time we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. Let's bow. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you, Lord, that we have been able to be together, have you in our presence. Dear Lord, that we have done our best to put things of the outside world away from us, concentrate on your love, the sacrifice you offered, and the sacrifice that your son accepted in order that we might be saved. Father, we thank you for the things that's been said this morning and done here. We thank you for our ability to sing these songs, to express praise for your help, for your love, for your guidance, and for our condition here on earth that we may sing those praises so that we may satisfy you and those songs would go up as a sweet smelling savor for you and we know that we are your people here that are doing this. Go with us as we leave this place, Father, and bring us back again to the next appointed time. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.